Coming up on America's Heartland. Discover how a family in Alaska started the only flour mill in the state using barley that's sustainably grown and harvested on their farm. Meet a family in South Dakota that's using innovative ranching practices to not only help their livestock, but improve the land as well. People talk about us and I think that's good. They watch what we do. See how a researcher in Texas is partnering with a local farmer to test out a theory. Can sheep effectively remove weeds from cotton fields? And meet the women behind this organic farm in Pennsylvania that's been a leader in sustainability in their region for generations. It's all next on America's Heartland. Support for America's Heartland provided by Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. SARE is a USDA grants program for farmers, researchers, and educators. Since 1988, SARE grantees have used their own innovative ideas to improve profitability, stewardship, and quality of life on farms and ranches across the U.S. More information at SARE.org. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's heartland, living close to the land. There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand in America's heartland, living close, close to the land. It's breakfast time at the Wrigley Farm, a scene playing out every morning on thousands of farms all across the heartland. A meal shared and cherished by Bryce Wrigley, wife Jan, son Milo, daughter-in-law Leah, and their kids, Peyton and Chad. What makes this breakfast unique? Well, the hot cereal and pancakes are made from barley grown and harvested right here on this 1,700-acre farm about 100 miles outside Fairbanks. What's more, the mixes are manufactured at the Alaska Flour Company, built by the Wrigley's in 2011, and also right here on the farm. This is the only commercial flour mill in the state of Alaska. We were farmers, and this was a really big step for us to take on. The family says they built the flour mill for several reasons. They wanted to grow this area's barley products beyond cattle feed. They wanted consumers to experience the health benefits of barley. And they wanted to provide a reliable Alaska-grown food source to consumers in the state and beyond. We were just trying to market a crop that would become uh, an alternative to hunger in the event of an emergency. And, uh, and then we find out that what we're building is actually really healthy for you. When people understand our love for what we do, that we are here to provide healthy food for them that we would do for our own families. That focus on helping others is also deeply rooted in the Wrigley's desire to help fellow farmers and the environment. That means sustainable agriculture. Since 2010, they've practiced no-till, reducing soil disturbance and allowing residue from the previous harvest to remain on the soil. Fallowed fields are planted with a mix of up to 15 cover crops during Alaska's short growing season. Here are long rows of cover crop test plots, each planted with different species. Cover crops feed the soil microbes that build organic matter and enhance soil health. Healthier soils result in better barley harvests and also help prevent carbon from entering the atmosphere. To me, sustainability means just being able to have something that goes on perpetually and in perpetuity. You're not um, degrading the soil, so, and, and you're always looking for something to improve it. If you want to try something, but you're not sure you can afford it, try it on a small scale. Bryce shares the benefits of sustainability at gatherings like this one, the third annual Soil Health Field Day, hosted by the Salcha Delta Soil and Water Conservation District at the Wrigley's Farm. Here, soil experts like Jay Fuhrer offer hands-on demonstrations, showing farmers how no-till and cover crops reduce erosion, save water, protect the environment, and restore nutrients to the soil. 
This demonstration brings a smile. Men's cotton briefs are buried for six weeks in different fields. Hey. The tidy whities dug up in a no-till cover crop field are the most decomposed. A sure sign there's a lot of healthy microbes hard at work. We bring the, the full array, the full complement, the full suite of soil health practices. And I think we, at the end of the day, we'll, we'll have a much more sustainable future for everyone. Farmers learn best by actually coming out to a field day and seeing what are you doing and how are you doing it and what, is, what do you feel about this? For Bryce, perhaps the most meaningful role is serving on the Administrative Council for the Western Region of SARE, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. Made up of farmers and other ag stakeholders, the council sets grant program priorities based on farmers' needs, allowing them to work together, studying challenges and opportunities known to be important to the region. That's what I like about it. We're not being told what we should do, that research is responding to actual needs that we have on the ground. Farmers can receive direct grants to undertake their own sustainable experiments or work with scientists on larger research projects. Most important, SARE makes sure it's all gathered and shared. When the research gets done, it's available to search and to learn from, and, um, and then a farmer can make his own decision on, on what his farm can do. Okay. And there's Followed no other program where that happens course. to that degree. The Wrigley say it's all part of the values most farmers share with consumers. The hope they'll leave the land better than how they found it. That the next generation will continue this noble profession and celebrate the closeness it brings to their families. We want this farm to be not only available for Milo's generation, for our son's generation, but for his kids and we hope that this continues. You know, our farm is a generational farm. We're, we're going to be around for generations, and so we want to, you know, take care of the ground that, that gives us so much. Every day we come out here and look out at our fields and what we have, and we just, you know, we realize we're very blessed and fortunate. Still ahead. See how the younger generation is bringing ideas from abroad to their family farm in South Dakota. About 25 miles outside of Lemon, South Dakota, just over the North Dakota state line, the Gogler Farm sits on 4,000 acres of rolling hills. In the nearly 100 years that the Gogler family has farmed here, things have certainly changed. Yet, they've also stayed the same. A lot of what we're doing today has been done already. I mean, it's not new, but we have some small pieces of technology that enable us to change how we're going about it. Drew Gogler and his sister Erin grew up on this land. Both went away to college. After graduating as a mechanical engineer, Drew worked in Africa, New Zealand, and Australia, gaining valuable insight into farming practices around the world. Erin is finishing up her PhD in range sciences. Their parents, Jody and Harold Gogler, both hold master's degrees and share a passion for learning with their family. And they both had the opportunity to, to see the world and they've brought a lot of things that, that the United States people don't do. They dug wells and used solar to pump them. They planted trees to provide a windbreak for the cattle. And they created a habitat that attracts wildlife to help foster a healthier functioning landscape. Those are all things that, From Australia. that we wouldn't have done. Those are things that younger generations can do. Drew and Aaron applied for grants from SARE, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program through the USDA. It's an organization focused on providing funding to farmers who want to try new things, specifically research that can be done in the field with the purpose of acquiring new ways of farming sustainably. It allowed us to come up with creative ideas that maybe hadn't been tried elsewhere implement them, and then learn from those projects. Over the years, they've been awarded three different SARE grants. The first was focused on a winter management strategy known as bale grazing. 
It's a way to improve soil health on this land that has been farmed for the last century. Fail grazing is really a regenerative practice. It's how we are taking hay fields that have been um, reaching the end of their productive period and we regenerate them back into being highly productive. The gogglers spread out bales in the fall that feed their livestock through the winter. At the same time, cattle are kept in smaller areas and rotated through different pastures every week or so. This means the manure they produce doesn't pile up and need to be hauled out. Instead, the cattle help fertilize the land by spreading the manure just by walking around. It's like mulching for a garden, but it's just on a larger scale. We're not spending all of that time running the tractor, burning the fuel, and the cattle are working a little bit more for us and helping us accomplish our goals. The second SARE grant is designed to enhance the benefits of bale grazing through the incorporation of multi-species, specifically sheep. The reason? Different livestock function in different ways. The sheep forage and distribute manure differently than cattle, which improves soil health and forage production across the landscape. They've also just begun incorporating SARE grant number three, keyline cultivation. This includes cutting slits in the land that manure deposits and runoff flow into to help improve soil health and water retention. It's a way of farming once unfamiliar to many in this region. Sometimes it takes time and input from the younger generation to say, hey, Ma, why are you doing that? And so just taking time to stop and think why we do things. In order to stay in business, we have to consider what sustainability is and what that means on the resources that you manage. For me, it's doing what's right for the land, but also doing what keeps you in business so you can continue to do what's right for the land. It's a place that we all call home, and, and it's really nice that it's going to be handed down to another generation, and they're going to do the same thing we are, and, and hopefully take it beyond what we've done. Yeah, I was going to say, they won't do it the same. No. <laughs> Maybe not the same, but the gogglers do believe that with the practices they're implementing now, their family will be farming on this land for decades to come. Up next, go inside an experiment in Texas to see if sheep can remove weeds from cotton fields without eating the crop. This West Texas field may not look like a university laboratory, but the agricultural research on these 44 cotton plots in San Angelo, Texas could dramatically reduce the need to use chemicals to fight weeds. Don't look for researchers in white lab coats here. Instead, these sheep in their own woolly white coats are the focus of the research. We've got certain weed species that are becoming very problematic, and a lot of these are very palatable for sheep. And so the logic here is that sheep will graze the weeds in the cotton before they eat the cotton. And so we approach this um, for one, kind of as proof of concept, because this has never been documented in a scientific research project running sheep in a cotton crop as a method of weed management. Moving their woolly assistants from corral to the field lab, Dr. Reagan Nolan and student Matt Stewart are testing two of the research variables, timing and intensity. At what stage of cotton growth do you start weeding with sheep? And how long do you keep the sheep in the crop field? Having this many plots helps researchers better test those variables. The good news, as the sheep do their weeding work, they avoid eating the cotton plants because the plants themselves contain a toxin that sheep find less than tasty. They're keeping the cotton a lot cleaner, so it's exciting to see the contrast between the weedy plots and those that we're running sheep in. Texas leads the nation in cotton production and raises the lion's share of organic cotton grown in America. That share has grown in recent years thanks to higher prices for the organic fibers. Add to that consumers preferring the feel that organic fibers deliver in clothing. And they like products raised without the use of chemicals. But foregoing chemical herbicides to control weeds has been a challenge, along with protecting the soil for future crops. When we get into sustainability, 
this is a big factor. So a lot of cotton weed management is tillage intensive, especially in an organic system where they can't use herbicides. And so they're plowing a lot. They're burning a lot of fuel and they're disturbing the soil quite a bit to manage those weeds. And then what weeds they don't catch with a cultivator, they're hand weeding or they're not being able to control them. You look through here and the only weeds that are out here are right here where the cotton is. So we can't get it with any type of mechanical plow. In addition to the Texas A&M University research, sheep rancher Chad Rains is using 145 of his animals for real world weed control in this West Texas organic cotton field owned by a neighbor. Dr. Reed Redden, a sheep specialist, is following the results. Which of these weeds um, do you see the sheep really selectively go after? You know, it's kind of like on my cover crops, the sheep, they, they like the variety. Funding for this research project comes from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's SARE program, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. SARE offers grants directly to researchers as well as farmers and ranchers who want to explore new ideas or innovations. We need the basic science. We need the people in the lab generating you know, new and novel technologies that you'd never really think of, uh, but we also need the applied people, and that's where SARE has been a great partner uh, for this type of grant and, and several others in the past. The grants also remove some of the risk that farmers or ranchers like Chad might face if they tried out a new agricultural practice on their own. We can't afford to, to stump our toe on something that might work and might not work and you get out here and you have a train wreck and things fall apart and, and we're doing it on our own. It's, it could be devastating to an operation. Growers and ranchers say there are mutual benefits to sheep weeding. Seth Fortenberry owns the organic cotton fields being used by Chad Rains. The weeds provide forage for Chad's sheep, keeping his feed costs down. And Seth eliminates a cost he's faced in the past. We had mainly just had to hire labor, you know. I mean, people to go out there and weed the fields manually. And these sheep, you know, are obviously, they work 24 seven, you know, all the time. I mean, you don't have to worry about them showing up. You don't have to worry about paying them. I mean, you know, they, they just are good workers. With organic cotton fetching higher prices than non-organic, Farmers say that sheep weeding can deliver savings, economically and environmentally. A lot of our land is family land. It's been in my family for generations. I want to take care of it. And sustainable for me is that I'm doing, I'm doing my job. I'm taking care of it. It's going to last. It's going to be here for my kids and my grandkids. And, and uh, it's, you know, it's still going to be productive. Coming up, a women-owned farm in Pennsylvania that's helping to advance sustainability practices in their region. From a very early age, I was working in the fields with my parents. My dad grew up on a farm about eight miles from here, and his father was an organic farmer. My grandfather kind of stayed true to organic practices and very much influenced my dad in that way. Everywhere you look, you'll see the influence of Deborah's father and grandfather on these 75 acres of land. It's called Village Acres Farm, and it's known in central Pennsylvania for being a leader in sustainability. Today, the farm is run by Deborah Brubaker and her wife, Hannah Smith Brubaker. Deborah's sisters, Phoebe and Angela Brubaker, also run a commercial flower business on the farm, making this a true family affair. We have cropland, about five to seven acres of, of vegetable crops, as well as uh, doing pastured livestock. We grow about 50 different varieties of vegetables, um, and the breed of sheep that we raise is Shetland, which is traditionally from Scotland. They do a really good job in everything from weed control to returning nutrients to the soil. In the early days, Village Acres Farm was a place where customers could pick their own berries. At other times, the farm offered community-supported agriculture, or CSA, boxes. Today, they mostly sell their produce at local restaurants. Deborah says she and her siblings were raised by parents who believed that farming was a higher calling. I think it's the fusion of my dad's real interest in farming with my mom's love of birds, flowers, everything to really kind of create a property that really looks out for, 
for both food for humans as well as, as the natural environment. We know that mom and dad really wanted it to be a place that fed other people, not just food, but also valuable relationships. And so we've been sort of um, looking at how flowers are integrated. The flowers bring in a new income stream, and just as important, they're good for the crops. So we've added a lot of flowers to our farm, which is great because that's a great enterprise, but at the heart of it, we can grow better vegetables attracting the bees. The family has made other changes to increase sustainability on the land. They planted 3,000 native trees, creating a buffer along the creek. That buffer prevents soil from washing into the creek when it rains. We want that soil to stay in the fields. And so we've been working with farmers um, for a couple of years now to establish trees along the creek on their farms so that it's cleaner water when it comes our way to our farm. Working with other farmers on sustainability projects is one of Hannah's passions. She has been a farmer leader with SARE, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program run by the USDA. She first learned of SARE when Deborah's father received a grant from them to try out blackberry trellises on her farm to see if the fruit would be easier to harvest. That experience inspired her to get even more involved, helping to oversee SARE grants to other farmers in the Northeast who are interested in sustainability. Since its beginnings in 1988, SARE has funded close to 9,000 projects on farms across the nation. In our area, I've seen farmers use the program for everything from figuring out some new tool that's gonna make their day a little bit easier to testing different varieties of vegetables and fruits that particularly with the changing climate are gonna be able to produce a better product. So these are the paprika peppers, two different varieties. While Village Acres Farm is notable for its sustainability practices, they say there's something else that sets them apart. Honestly, I think what's probably makes us most notable is that we're a bunch of women on this farm. So right now all my mother, the three of my siblings, my partner who's also a woman, um, is, is sort of what identifies us to the, to the larger community. In the end, we're really a united force. We know that we want to feed people, that we want to create a beautiful and ecologically sound environment, and that takes all of us. That's it for this edition of America's Heartland. See episodes, recipes, and more on our website, americasheartland.org. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America. Living close to the land There's a love for the country And a pride in the brand In America's heartland Living close Close to the land Support for America's heartland provided by Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. SARE is a USDA grants program for farmers, researchers, and educators. Since 1988, SARE grantees have used their own innovative ideas to improve profitability, stewardship, and quality of life on farms and ranches across the U.S. More information at SARE.org.